And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother here in the temple. Sorry, carbonation. <laughs> Making his victory lap after the successful launch of War and Aether, the one and only Alex Zubarev. How are you doing Hello! Today, I am doing fantastic. It's been a uh, rough past few weeks getting the game to launch state, but uh, it's finally happening and I am so damn proud and excited for it. Mm -hmm. So... <sighs> I suppose I suppose we can I suppose we can start on with that because um, as I recall you ended up have you ended up making a few revisions before the thing was finally launched. Were there were there some were there some major things you had to you had to get you had to get adjusted? Yeah. Uh, so the long and short of it is that in the last couple months leading up to the final release of the game, mm -hmm. I was going through, doing all the editing, making sure everything was pitch and perfect, making some last minute characters and adjustments. But every time that I thought I was done, I was like, ooh, oh, that's a really good idea. And that would really do well to supplement here. All right, so spend a week creating, implementing, and putting that idea in. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I got another idea. And, uh, you know, just finding fixes and balances along the way. So the last couple months was uh, really delaying the final product of the game as I was adding in new systems such as skill training. So you have more of stuff to do in, in between times in campaigns when the characters are effectively off screen, you know, when they're camping, when they're sleeping, when they're not in active gameplay, they can train up their skills, reallocate their skill points, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some new weapons, uh, equipment, and just some overall rebalancing of certain game mechanics and talents so that everything fitted and worked a lot better together and more cohesively. Mm -hmm. But overall, it delayed the game, but I wouldn't have done it any other way. Every single change I've added, I am super proud and happy with. Yeah. Now, when it obviously go, going over going over some of the get, going over some of the um, some of the mechanics would be kind would be kind of repeating ourselves, and I don't right. and I don't like to do that. I don't like to yeah. do that because I'd like to at least build on the the um, previous interview. Yeah, the fine details might have changed in the last, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, like six, five, six months since we last did an interview, mm -hmm. but all of the core details are still there. All the core mechanics with the professions, skill points, advancement, monsters, mm -hmm. everything there is still the same. Yeah. And uh, if people want to know more, they can check out our previous Warren Aether interview on the Mildred the Monk channel on YouTube. Yep. Now, we had... We... We did kind we did kind of dip into into some into some of the inspirations. I know I know that in this you had mentioned I I believe Dragon's Dogma was a name that got mentioned, as yep. well as um as well as The Witcher. Yep. Um. Now, when it came, um, I suppose I suppose one thing that one thing that I'd be curious about asking is. Since since the since the Witcher was was a big thing and and you mentioned that's where the, that's where your concept of alchemy ended up met ended up um taking fr taking fruit mm -hmm. um I'm a bit I'm a bit curious as to as to how you would th it, you would theoretically implement the so the sword fighting style of Ga of Garrett not, Ga um... not Garrett Geralt. So the problem the problem when you have two names so similar in the in the back of your head plus I've been playing the thief games lately right um what do you mean by the sword fighting style in particular um, um more 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 just more just how he not not necessarily the whole the whole steel and silver thing which um was which was not in the which was not in the books but then again the books are written by an are written by a asshole so i'm willing to ignore right. some parts of that um 
I think I, I think I told you the story about that. I believe so. Yeah. But more of more of more of the more of the way that get that Geralt of Rivia handles the handles the handles the sword. Um, or it's it calling it calling it um standard standard hack and slash would be a bit of a bit of an under a bit of a misnomer given how he moves in the um in a in a lot of the gameplay modes that you see that you see whether it be in any of the games. Yeah, he's far more fanciful and skillful and intended with every single move and yeah. step he makes. He knows what he's doing five steps ahead of time every time. Did you ever did you ever play the first game? As jank as it was at times. I played it for all of a few hours. Uh, the entire Witcher series went on sale on Steam once. I got all three games. Mm -hmm. I had already played the second game previously in my life. and But I got a chance to play the first game. And at the end of the day, it was a little too jank for me to really immerse myself into. Especially since I was first introduced to the Witcher series with The Witcher 2. Mm -hmm. But I did get a few hours into it. Yeah. The main reason I bring that I bring that up is because is because that is because for the first game and only in only in the first game, they the there was an attempt to codify his um Geralt's fighting style in in three in three subtypes strong, fast, and group. Right. I do think I do th at the very least because trying trying to go with trying to go with the more unified approach that was in um, two and three might co might create problems. So, how would you, at the very at the very least, Im with the system that you have for War and Aether, how would you implement that three style setup? Well, in the base game, it's just not there. Mm -hmm. As I wanted the base game to be a lot more simple and easier to pick up. The game's taken inspiration from games like The Witcher and Dragon's Dogma, but it's kind of looser inspiration. I've remade my own thing out of it. Mm -hmm. But if I were to implement the three different fighting styles, then what I'd probably theoretically do is implement them as three separate skill trees with unique sets of talents to unlock with each, so that you could have the three different fighting styles while all fighting with the same weapon and being able to switch on the fly between what abilities you're using and what talents you have access to you in the moment. Mm -hmm. And in, so you, it, would it be, a, now you already have, you already have, you already have a set of combat skills, but I'm guessing you, I'm guessing you would have, you, you would have re, you would have reworked it into, into instead of combat skills being based on, um, weapons being based on styles. Yeah, basically. I I can I can cer I can certainly go I can certainly go with that. That or at least so much as having both, because some styles don't work with some weapons, and some weapons can utilize multiple styles. So it'd be more along the lines of if I were to implement a system like that in, I would have both the towns from the weapons and the weapon styles separately and uniquely. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I know some would, I know some would say that's a little bit, that's a little bit fiddly, but, um, there's always going to be a fid, a degree of fiddliness when personalization comes into the picture. Yeah, exactly. Like if you want, if you want it, to, if you want it to be less fiddly, then playing, then playing a game where customization is one of the selling points, maybe not the best option. <laughs> maybe you, maybe you can um go, maybe you can go back to a, to a, to um AD and D again. <laughs> right, right. You know, but speak um speaking of speaking of that um when it comes to when it, when it comes to classes, which is always a contentious thing for a lot for a lot of people. Um. Were there were there ti were there times or uh, maybe I asked this beforehand, but were there times early on where you tried to go full classless instead instead of bringing in the um, archetype system that you have that you have? Well, here's the thing: is that actually it is a classless system to me, at least. Mm -hmm. Like the advancements that you get later on at uh, every tenth level within the game, they are there to help supplement 
and narrow down a play style of getting these specific skill bonuses or this specific ability to help you out. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing that restricts you from which advancements you can pick up. So, for me, the, the game is classless. There are themes from classes that help build out the professions and the advancements, mm -hmm. but everything there is open and you can build your character however you want. Yeah. But to me, I like that uh, the advancements exist for the sole fact of I like to have that level of rigidity in there, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, to go completely full classless just skill points alone, I feel like that doesn't give you the depth in and of itself. And you need something like advancements so that players can actually start to build into certain play styles. I suppose, I suppose a case in point of what happens when you tr when you try and go full classless in that regard is, look at how ever look at how so many people's runs with um with Elder Scrolls games end up being the same. Yeah, exactly. Oh, um, and yeah, yeah, there is the fact that ta that um that Skyrim tried to implement talents, although in my opinion they kind of screwed up by missing the point. Um. But at but at the same t at the same time, the combination of of the of everything being so dependent on skills, you end up with you end up with a, with a bunch of a bunch of gishes or sometimes straight up mage archers because, well, melee combat and other scrolls has been my whipping boy for most of my life. <laughs> right. Oh. But it, but it's not. But that seems to be the setup that you that you see very often. People, do, um, archer and some and some type of magic. Right, right. And don't get me wrong. I don't. I don't have anything against the idea of gishing, as it's called. Mm -hmm. But it is one. Of, it is one of those things with a lot of traps. Traps. Tra. In ter in terms of in terms of um, a lot of games when they try when they try and do the whole idea of someone being good and good in fighting and good at magic, you end you end up with somebody who's marginally okay in both, but ends up getting vastly outstripped in encounters unless they've got backup. Right, right, gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I like to have my game build out the skills into whatever you think is most important. And each skill serves the function that it's meant to serve. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be somebody who's good at both magic and combat, you are only limited by the amount of skill points you get per level based on how you built your character's trait scores at the start. Mm -hmm. And if you make yourself strong in one area, you're going to end up sacrificing somewhere, somewhere else. So yeah. even with the open profession and advancement uh, character creation system, you still end up having players finding niches for themselves and being able to support each other's weaknesses if you have a, you know, a functioning party. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you bring up the whole supporting people's weaknesses because um, on Fridays I've been going through a game called Heavens and Heresies. And mm -hmm. the cre Tanner, the creator of the game, did a did a piece early on called called the myth of self sufficiency. Oh, go on. The idea the idea with it, and this was a core part of his game design, is you is it is a contradiction in his, in his eyes to have to have characters be a, be a certain level of self sufficient in a team game. Right. And I do. I think. So, and in his mind, in his mind, he had. To, I remember him telling me that some, some builds and some archetypes seem to be seem to be laser focused on the idea of them of them being a one person party. Looking at you, clerics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. When it comes to any sort of team games like tabletops in general, I don't like the idea of having one person shine as the one who can do everything. For one reason or another, I want my players to be able to go into a niche and support each other in some areas. I mean, you get deep enough into War and Aether. You know, you get 
uh, a shit ton of skill points per level, you get into the levels 20s, 30s, or even 40s. And sure, you can get a player that's eventually going to be able to do everything on their own. But at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do by yourself. You need players to support you in other areas. And most of the game is really going through the 1 through 20 grind, even though it has support going beyond mm -hmm. and through that area you're definitely not going to be able to do everything yourself you're going to need other players other specialties and even then when you have other players i built this game in mind with supporting every play style to the extent of when you assemble your party you're not choosing who's going to be what play style you're choosing what play styles are you going to sacrifice? Because okay. I tried to my strongest degree to make this game one where every single play style, no matter what you want to do, is legitimate, relevant, and powerful to the point of you have five people in your party, that's five different play styles, but there's so many more, you're going to have to sacrifice somewhere and be weak somewhere. Oh, God. Don't get don't get me started on the whole, pick, on the whole picking part, because... I think I told you this in the in the past, but I've done I've done um I've done my fair share of of GMing one shots at my LGS, and it would drive me up it would drive me up a damn wall when I would when I would make ex explicitly clear that I'm playing something classless. My favorite example is using Earth Dawn, and then I he and then I hear the I hear the players at the table going, "Okay, who's going to be the tank? Who's going to be the he the healer?" <laughs> I'm like. Okay. I'm like, I'm I want I want to smack you, but I but I'm not but I'm not allowed to engage in violence in public. I uh, when I was developing this game, mm -hmm. I mentioned this in the previous interview at some point. I had two main parties who were my biggest test groups. Mm -hmm. One that was focused on min maxing the shit out of everything in the game, mm -hmm. and the other party who just wanted to play and enjoy and exceeded at the role play. Mm -hmm. And for me, I enjoyed seeing both sides of it. As for me, in my own GMing style, I just want my players to play whatever they want and how they want. Mm -hmm. So I'd have one group that's figuring out, okay, you'll be the tank, you'll build this way, you'll be the ranger, you'll go this way, I'll be the bard, and I'll build this way. And then you have the other group who's like, Half of us are courtesans because we want to be courtesans. Yeah, um, not sure if I mentioned this, but one, but um, the owner of one of one of those LGSs had put up had put up a absolutely no Matt Mercer sign after I joked about it. <laughs> in this, in you remember the no, you remember the no stairway to heaven sign in Wayne's World. I can't say I do no. Um, it it was a get it was a gag in the Wayne's World movie where um. <laughs> Where one where one character is about to is about to play the opening the opening chord from Stairway to Heaven, and then the get the then the get the guy in the store just takes the guitar away, points to the sign that says absolutely no Stairway to Heaven. Because <laughs> the whole reason I did it, I was getting sick of people bringing up bringing up how Matt Mercer does things as a G, as a GM when when somebody who was clearly unexperienced was questioning my methods. Right, right. And I got so sick of it. I said, I said I should put a Wayne's World sign saying no, saying no, saying no, Matt Mercer. Then a week later, he ends up, he ends up, make, he ends up putting up a, he ends up putting the sign up. <laughs> I don't have any problems with GMs like Matt. I don't have any problems with any GMs at all. I just find that everybody has their own GMing style. Uh, whether you're brand new or a several years veteran, everyone has their own way of running games. And for that, everybody also has their own way of enjoying games. And it's about finding a group of players that you can match up with your GMing style as yeah. well. Oh, obviously, obviously, finding a group of players isn't isn't exactly something I can do when it when that's not when that's out of my control. In the yep. in the case of running one, uh, running LGS one shots. But the approach that I've always had as a GM is, I'll work with you. You work with me. I'll, whenever before I even set up, I'll usually have a, I'll usually have a primer during session zeros going. Okay, this is the this is the system we're using. This is the setting we're playing it in. This is the tone that I'm that I'm shooting for. 
and this and the and the and these are these are the archetypes that that are would prob that you're probably going to have to do a bit more explaining than usual like right um for example if i'm running lex arcana which is a roman punk game that i'm well, calling it punk it's more of roman alternate history that <laughs> is heavy in the investigation end of things might not be the best idea to try and go the murder hobo thing because yeah. you're not you're not going to be doing a whole lot of fighting. So if some if somebody picks a more fighting archetype, I'll probably tell them, yeah, you're you're um be adv I'm not saying I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying you should be adv you should be advised that you may not be you may not be fighting as much as you think. Yeah, and I mean it's totally fair to be able to. Warn isn't a good word, but it's also the best way I can come up with is advise. warn your players that of advise, yeah. Advise your players of what's going to be happening with the campaign, what they can expect, mm -hmm. and so that way they don't get end up locking themselves into a play style that they can't enjoy to its fullest. Yeah. I've especially had to do this with um Legend of the Five Rings, if you're familiar with that. Where also had... unfamiliar. Um Legend, but go on. Legend of the Five Rings is is very much a sam very much a mix of fantasy and samurai drama. It is not trying to be feudal Japan, which some grogs insi insist on bring have insisted on bringing up to me for the last fifteen years. <laughs> uh, but it, at, which is gonna be which is gonna be ridiculous when L five R is trying to be is trying to lean more into Kurosawa style samurai. Than "quote unquote" realism, right? But, but there is a large, large emphasis on political intrigue. I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, somewhat analogous to say Game of Thrones, except you're not dealing with as many assholes and severed heads. Yeah. Oh, uh, but because, but because of that, um, and the fact that combat is infamously lethal, where where even even a mid range even a mid or late game character can go down in a couple good hits. You, com, um, ex excess amounts of combat is generally not advised. And if you end, if you end up picking fights, then somebody might challenge you to a duel, and then there goes your head, or de or de or or somebody yanks you back and demands you commit seppuku. But also, I like games that are unforgiving like that. Which is, I mean, that's part of a big reason why I made War and Aether the way it is. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult and brutal game for somebody who likes to just run in and start swinging immediately. But I, I like the unforgiving things because, to me, I'm a huge fan of realism. And when you don't give your players, whether it's for story reasons or for game mastering reasons, that leeway with the world, I find it more realistic and enjoyable. Yeah. You know, I like having that threat of, you can go fight that thing, sure, if you want to pick a fight. Don't don't get upset if you die. Yeah. Given how, given how art is often a response to other art, were there were there any instances with with other games that you had G, that you had GM'd where it's where it seemed that the players were a little bit too powerful for what you were trying to do? More than anything, I actually had that experience when I was running a Pathfinder campaigns. Uh, I've run several different types of games. I've played Pathfinder, the Star Wars Tabletops, Edge of the Empire, 7 C, Deadlands, Call of Cthulhu, Fallout, Pen and Paper, and more. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found that the one where I had that most often was Pathfinder. And... More than anything, I don't think it was a problem with Pathfinder itself, but it was the fact that it was such a massive game, Pathfinder First Edition, that there was nothing that I could... I could never plan for everything, and especially when you get into the later levels of the game, post, like, level 10, level 15, mm -hmm. people can do some really, just, quite frankly, fucky shit. You know, have like, you, people have... making wishes outright or taking the control of the minds of high political figures and there have been more than one occasion where i thought my players are uh this is their world now i have no control over this yeah that's 
a lot of a lot of that is is issues that are grandfathered in that that some people insist on keeping for in the name of tradition or some or something like that um and let's see when it comes to when it comes to something like pat when it comes to something like pathfinder and just that era of d20 as a whole are you familiar with the term codzilla no i'm not go on codzilla is short is shorthand for cleric or druid, and then Godzilla. It <laughs> it has also been referred to as playing D and D on easy mode, and thusly playing Pathfinder on easy mode. Where right, the, you haven't you have an issue where the where classes like the druid and the cleric, there's so much that they can potentially do that they end up becoming entire parties unto themselves. Like look at a cleric. You can we you can we you can wear armor and weapons. You can cast. You can heal. You can d you can screw over you can screw over undead. And and at the and at the same time you can, you can take you can take a few hits. Right, um, right. Or in the case of in the case of druids, you would think that the, one would think that druids would be a little would be a little more squishy because of the fact that they have to wear. That they have to, that they can't wear the heavier kinds of armor because that's metal. Well, all that is circumvented with wild shape. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's, and even worse, um, there are certain bills that Pathfinder brought in where you could. Wa Normally, the drawback with wild shape is that you can't cast. Well, people found out builds early on in Pathfinder where you could wild where you could wild shape and still cast. <laughs> yeah. Uh so you can go you can go into like bear form, be tough be tough as nails, and still have all access to all your spells. And just because those spells have a limited amount of uses because of the of the whole Vancian thing that I've mentioned I don't care for. It's a cold mm -hmm. comfort when you're only doing a certain number of encounters per day and and they have that many spells. Podzilla. I get yeah. it. Um in D in uh, when D and D fifth edition came came along, we've um, rechristened it to Cowzilla, just replacing the druid with the warlock. Right. Because again, again, it's the problem of you have you have one class that is that is, in a, in any other game would be the would be a protagonist and say the bard's tale or something or something like that. Um. But I. I would I. But when it comes to when it comes to that, look, but in my in my experience, when it comes to adding difficulty, um, it's very it's very e it's very easy to make it accept to make that excessively swingy, and uh, after all, um, after all, XCOM's Long War is the, is the thing that breaks lesser men, <laughs> but but. For you, how do you how do you balance how do you balance that to make thing to make things challenging but not praying to RN Jesus that you, that the dice don't completely screw you? For me, it's one part experience as a GM and how much effort my players put in. Mm -hmm. The so for example, um, I don't have anything that's like the hard combat rating system that you see in Pathfinder or D&D, the CR that monsters have. Yeah, because I feel like that. I couldn't I feel like I the CR was never really reliant to begin with. So, when I made my creatures, I just went with they have a threat level like players or they have a level like players because they're built very similarly to players and puts them on a similar playing field and they have a threat level which when you play the game gives you a general gauge of how powerful is this thing compared to other things? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's one part experience of I've played the game a lot. I have my players. I know what they can handle and can't handle. I know this group can handle three undead units and this group could handle five. Mm -hmm. But it also comes down to the players themselves. They have their own agency when it comes to how difficult combat encounters are, especially in War and Aether. Because for me, the biggest thing I try to do more than anything with this game is reward players for preparation, uh, for knowledge, making 
it so that any sort of strategy or tactics they try to prepare for ahead of time is rewarded and that knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. So I find that oftentimes is the case I can have a monster that I think is really strong and will be a really powerful fight against the party, but they end up finding out what the monster is ahead of time, its strengths and weaknesses, plan a trap, they kill it in one turn. Uh, a dragon! Yeah. Dragon, one of the most powerful creatures I have in my game. I literally had a party uh, just a couple months ago. They one-shot a dragon. To my own astonishment, they managed it. <laughs> just from the sheer planning and prep they put into it. Meanwhile, another party, I can throw in a couple big rats and think, okay, this is just an easy fight, something to tide them over and keep them entertained. And some of them end up with pretty gruesome injuries. They just run in swinging. They don't plan. They don't prepare. They don't think it through. They just sprint in, start swinging. One of them loses an arm, and I'm just sitting back like, oh, Jesus, this this turned into an altercation. <laughs> uh, it is funny you bring up the planning thing, given that The Witcher was one of your inspirations, because when it comes to doing Witcher's work in 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 the in the games, especially in two and in, and even more especially in three, you have that kind of you have that kind of loop. Um, I'd say Monster Monster Hunter also has this kind also has this kind of loop of of preparation and the like because it's not like you just go into a certain area and there's the monster you have to hunt. No, right. you no you go to you go to where an incident happened. Try and um, do a bit of detective work to see what sort of monster you're dealing with. Um, scout, um, try and try and trace it by try, trace it by footsteps or or something else. Um, yeah. Go into the lair, prep for prep for what sort of setup you'd ha you'd have to do, whether or not you'd have to use certain signs if say you're dealing with a more supernatural foe. Um, and some sometimes not even ha sometimes not even have to fight it at all. Yeah. Um. Especially with how, especially with more intelligent things like well, dragons. Yeah. Um, and of of course, with with mo with something like Monster Hunter, a big a big part of that loop is track is tracking the thing down and chasing it when it when it retreats to different part to different parts of the sandbox. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. I do think that's I do think that is something to be to be rewarded. I'd I'd say I'd say the whole Russian the whole charging in. I'd say that's an I'd say that's an artifact of other ga of of um habits that other games have encouraged that are kind of grandfathered in. Yeah, yeah. Much, you know, much in the much in the same way that when I would run when I would um when I would ha when people would when people would come in pl to play um Infinity and their their previous experience with um with miniature wargaming was stuff like Warhammer and I had I had to teach them um they end up learning very quickly that you can't you can't do the you can't do the big charge and open ground unless you want to get full of holes yep. because of because of the fact that infinity has that rule that when you that when you activate a unit any any opposing unit that has line of sight gets a free shot <laughs> So it's so some people some people some people catch on quick. Some people have to learn the hard way. Yeah, and I try to run my games to an extent in that regard. I definitely try to when I'm running my own War and Aether games. Yeah. I like to emulate that Witcher sense of you are trying to investigate what the creature is. Uh, put it in piece by piece like a monster detective, identify the creature, and then prepare for the battle. Yeah. But I've also had my other fair share of... I've run this game in a high fantasy setting and other types of settings using the same rules. And for that, it's a lot more forgiving when you change the setting, and I find it works... It really depends on just the GMing style of the person who runs the game, you know? Oh yeah. Now, something something I do something I'll always find interesting is the way you is the way you set up spell casting in the sen in the sense that a lot of people when they do when they do a magic system, 
they usually end up having a big old list uh, list of spells and in your case you went to you went a little bit more um loose with loose with yeah. the approach not maybe we maybe we got to this last time but i think one of the reasons why you said is that you felt that note that because of because of how people pick up on because of how intrinsic it is with people who pick up magic they wouldn't be they shouldn't be using it the exact same way to a degree it's a large part of to me i i like me a hard magic system you know there are all sorts of uh, different soft magic systems like what you would find in Lord of the Rings and hard magic systems like what you'd find in Avatar The Last Airbender. Mm -hmm. I like me a hard magic system. I want my magic system to be something akin to a programming language. And in the real world, people are smart. People are going to figure things out. You're not going to just be limited to one spell and x amount of spell slots and whatever spell levels mm -hmm. the magic system is going to be uh it's going to be a programming language it's going to be something you can write and flow and change and cast as you need it and for that i try to emulate that entire system while also taking inspiration from dragon's dogma there's nothing i love more from dragon's dogma than the fact that spell strength has a direct correlation with cast time. Mm -hmm. I love that system. I wanted to bring it here, and I feel like it's a perfect balance of if you want to cast one of the bigger, most powerful spells imaginable, you could theoretically do it from level one. It's just the sheer cast time that goes into it that's going to stop you. That that and the fact that everybody's probably going to take notice of somebody's trying to cast something they shouldn't. Exactly. Some uh, some humans may not be that smart. Some humans may be hunting down exactly that kind of person who is casting spells. Monsters might not know, so you need your allies to protect you. Other monsters might be drawn to magic users to begin with. And it's all about having that balancing act of coming back to knowing what you're fighting and when. Where in the real world, knowledge and information is what wins wars and battles and I wanted to bring that into War and Aether as well. Mm -hmm. And when it comes now, in a lot of in a lot of games, there's with um le with leveling setups, there's a bit of a a bit of a tier setup. Um, some some ver some D twenty games will do will do this where they, where they try and put every five levels as as certain tiers. Um. I'd like to, I'd like to experiment with that a little and kind kind of get an idea of uh, about what what um what the what the scale what the power scaling would be for cert for certain levels i.e. i.e. how how adventurer a adventurer is at cer at certain level thresholds if you don't mind yeah yeah of course so um let's start let's start with level five mm -hmm. uh. So, I'm actually going to start with level 1, even. Because all, right. all NPCs are built exactly the same as players. Mm -hmm. The only thing that separates an NPC and a player is the fact that they've built themselves differently and what equipment they have access to. But mm -hmm. otherwise, how they are built is exactly identical. Mm -hmm. So, from level 1, that to me is any average normal person you run into any normal person shopkeep villager city folk uh some person working the fields working the woods what have you they're all going to be a normal generic level one uh npc who has their knowledge of the world has their knowledge of their trade skills but isn't quite as savvy when it comes to things in the greater world mm -hmm. at level five that's when you start getting into a little bit of training. This person has some knowledge. They are a bit more of an expert at what they do, but there's certainly still levels to reach. Uh, using people when it comes to military expertise, I'd say level five is the level of your common average guard. Somebody who has been given some equipment. They've been given some really basic training, but only enough that it lets them handle all of the simple situations nothing that they could do if they were up against a master of the craft, 
but they could definitely handle plenty of the villagers if they had to. Mm-hmm. Level 10 is when that starts to scale up, because now you go into advancements, you go into specializations. That's when you get people who have advanced their craft to the point where, okay, now I'm going to find my niche. Yeah, you know, the uh, people who decide that I want to be a guard, well, do you want to be a guard that's better at fighting people, that's better at controlling a crowd, that's better at protecting your allies? It's at level 10 you start to reach that level of skill when you can start to find your niche. Level 15 is where you start to become an expert at your craft, at your niche. Mm -hmm. At level 15 is when you would certainly start to distinguish amongst other people. Yeah, whereas level 10 is where you start to find your niche, level 15 is where you'd have the level of skill necessary that people would even uh, recognize your name or the state would recognize your talent mm -hmm. and you'd start being hired on for more important tasks. Level 20 is generally where I cap off all of my non-player characters. As level 20, I consider that as the absolute height of skill and talent. This is you are a absolute master of your craft. You are better than you at what you do. This is something that you have trained your life to do, and few can reach your level at this point. And that's generally where I cap off NPCs, but players are special, so they're allowed to ascend past level 20, which is when I start to, uh, when I'd call, you're at the point of going beyond the level of a master mm -hmm. and the deeper and deeper you go you ascend closer and closer to godhood mm -hmm. and now we've t with that in mind we've talked we've talked a fair bit about the about the mechanics but i do but i do want to cover one particular thing that we didn't we didn't have we didn't have enough time to delve into last time around and that is the default setting with the world of Z with the world of Zale, which um, you have no idea how thankful I am that there is a d that there is a default setting because I've been bitching about that with um, D and D and Pathfinder for decades. Well, yeah, D and D more so than Pathfinder. Pathfinder has a default setting; it's just that nobody uses it. Yeah. In fact, when, uh... when Savage Pathfinder came out, I had joked. Oh hey, pe Pathfinder fans will actually have to actually have to pay attention to Galarian for the first time ever. Yeah, for me, the default world of Zale fills two different roles for Warren Aether, the role-playing game as a book. Mm -hmm. Is that for one, some people just they they, they need that uh, that default world. Some people want to have a world that they can run their games in. Other people are brand new to tabletops and they don't know how or don't want to make a brand new world of their own to run the rule system in. And it serves that purpose of helping people come into the game and show them a starting point. But also, the world of Zale for me is a canon world where there are a lot more stories I want to tell. And the role-playing game is a nice kind of starting point to start revealing that world uh, and make it easier to tell the stories of that world. Mm -hmm. And was it a was it a case where these the question that I ask next next is essentially the chicken and egg? <laughs> was it a case where you ended up creating the setting for the setting first and and um? and then built a system around that or what or was it a, or was it the other way around and does this particular setting predate war and ether itself for this case it would be that uh the world of zale was created in response to the war and ether game I had created custom worlds plenty enough times in the past for my own tabletop games and adventures, mm -hmm. and when I wanted to play War and Aether, it was I needed uh, I needed a niche for a tabletop that I couldn't find. I made War and Aether, it needed a world to fill, so I started to work on the world of Zale. And the more and more I fleshed out the world, created its lore, and put everything in a context for the game, the mechanics, and why things the, are the way they are, I ended up creating, honestly, one of 
probably just my favorite custom world to date, and a world I want to play in for a long time, tell more stories in, and just dive a lot deeper into. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to that partic that particular um, world, I I did note that you had I did note that you had thanked Dungeon Draft in the opening pages of the book. So I'm get I'm guessing you had used that to help to help construct the uh, map the map itself. Um, not quite. The map of the western region regions mm -hmm. uh, reaches. Uh, the western reaches I made myself in Photoshop. Dungeon Draft was there for the introduction module at the end of the book, Trouble in Balfoyan. I made a map for the village of Balfoyan itself and for the uh, final fight in the module. And those maps I used uh, Dungeon Draft for. Dungeon Draft were really cool about it. I contacted them, and they told me that, uh, basically, you can use our assets, you can monetize on it, you're making it yourself. Just, uh, we'd appreciate a shout-out. Oh, which is, co which is cool, cool on their part. Um, yeah, phenomenal place. If you want to make your own custom maps, it's honestly worth getting. Now, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to setting, um, one particular issue that can that can happen in certain in certain settings, some more than others, is a continuity issue where there's where there's such a detailed um, background that it that it's difficult for that it can be difficult for players to figure out where they're going to slot themselves in. Right, and. When it comes to when it comes to the world of when it comes to the world of Zale, did you make sure that there were that there was enough detail to get an idea of a of a story, but not but not too much where people wouldn't where people wouldn't know where to slot themselves into it? To a degree, that also is something that I left open to the players themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, for that reason, uh, in the book, I gave Zale a brief history. But I didn't go into any of the details or specifics of the greater timeline. Mm -hmm. There is a greater timeline, a canon world, canon stories to be told all over the place of where things are, how they got there, how these things happen, why the world is the way it is. But at the end of the day, this is also a tabletop rule book. Mm -hmm. This doesn't feel like the place to for me to tell those stories, and this is the place for me to help new players get introduced to tabletops to begin with. Yeah. So while all those things exist, I left it open enough, hopefully, that players can get a brief understanding of the world that they're in, and then play it and branch out from there and make their own stories. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in, with that in mind, you're, I'd say you're, I'd say you're. De would you say that you're would you say that you're that you're kind of going for a for a high medieval um setup with the with the world? To a degree, uh, high medieval, low fantasy for sure. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, actually it also kind of depends. High medieval for certain, there is a very low bar for technology. There's only swords, bows and arrows, wagons. They don't have any of the higher technologies. The world has been in a constant state of war and chaos that's been similar to uh, our own Earth's Dark Ages that's kept it from ever advancing past a certain point. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, the world itself, uh, I like to have it in a low fantasy setting. That's where I find best. But in the greater timeline of Zale... Uh, I have basically a setting for low fantasy, high fantasy, and something in the middle as well. Yeah, I can, I, I can get, I can get that. Um, I, I, um, when I was look, when I was looking through, some, when I was looking through some aspects, I could, I could see, I could see some people t um, bringing up the, bringing up things like the golden age in Berser in Berserk, or even, even the. Um, even the historical, um, historical fiction in the in the sense of something like Vinland Saga, as as analogs for players. Oh. Yeah. At the at the same t at the same time though. When. When it comes to, one particular thing, I'm not sure if I asked this last time, 
but I'm curious if um the idea the idea of you the idea of doing a more hex crawl like a, like approach for campaigns was con had been considered or even even the idea of encounters out in the wild hex crawl oh oh because of the hexagon map right that's what that's one aspect of it but I've seen I've seen but it has more to do with the with the um with the mar with the western marches um map that you had put up yeah, so with uh, digitally on Google Drive, there's a version of the map that has the hexagon-based tiles. That's what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So the hexagon, it's basically there as an option and as a measuring tool. For me, more than anything, I use the hexagons as a measuring tool for t travel time, knowing that, oh, a player will take this many days to travel this many hexagons if they have to take this road how long will it take for them to get to a to b and it's not something i always use but while there's no explicit random encounter table in the book mm. that's 100 percent the thing i've done before is all right am i going to have a random encounter as they pass through these hexagons or not mm -hmm. which also kind of play in a part of which hexagons they're traveling through, if they're going through any forests, particularly dangerous areas, if they're on, or if they're just taking nice, safe, high roads that are well protected. Mm -hmm. And to that end, it's more of an option, and the option is there and available if anybody wants to use it. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, something, something else I'm, I'm, cu I'm curious about is. In a lot of in a lot of old school games, there's the, there's been the concept of after you re after you reach a certain threshold, you start you start gaining you start gaining some well stock, and are and are able to and end up having end up having followers maybe a whole maybe a holding. Um, is that something that you've experiment experimented with in cer in certain campaigns and yeah. certain play tests? One hundred percent. Uh. For me, it depends entirely on the players, what they do, and how they want to play their campaign. But 100%, I've had players do something as big as they want to take control of their own kingdom, create their own city-state, and make their own faction to play against the superpowers that exist in the Western Reaches. And also, as simple as a group of players who thought that a particular monster type called a boffin was a problem, so they started a local boffin awareness program in the city. Mm -hmm. yeah, 100 percent something I've experimented with myself, and I think it's fun, personally. Uh, it gives players that level of personal agency when they're playing in the world, it connects them to it more, and it allows them to feel like they've entered into something greater and they're really having effect on the state of the world but of course when you do that games like that aren't in my case specifically since i'm the creator they're not exactly canon stories when they do things like that mm -hmm. and on top of that i always add in the risk of the bigger you make the game for yourself the bigger it's going to get if you try to create your own city-state and your own kingdom and control these lands, the other countries and the other political powers that be are going to take notice and are going to want to get involved somehow, whether it be positively or negatively. Yeah. And to the to the to that particular to that particular end, um, when it comes. When it comes to when it come, now when it came to the um, sample adventure, which at the t at the time when we were when we had this kind of thing early on, I didn't have I don't think I had a whole lot of detail on it. Um, uh, if I remember right, at that time the sample adventure was just either not done at all yet, or it was the briefest, simplest thing. Now it's completely fleshed fleshed out in a full module. Yeah, you could you could probably separate that out and make that into a quick start. Um, yeah, exactly. But what what I was curious about is was was um 
when it came to when it came to trying to create a sample module for um for War and Aether, were you trying to were you trying to create an adventure that would hit a good amount of the highlights or what what was the what was the angle you wanted to tackle with that particular adventure? For me the sample adventure, Trouble in Balfoyan, mm -hmm. tackles what I think is the game at its best. Of course, people can disagree, and they might want to bring these rule sets and the game into different worlds, different settings, different stories. Mm -hmm. But I find the game is at its best when it has a very real, grounded adventure of these aren't heroes, these are normal, everyday people who have suddenly been thrusted into an extraordinary situation that means life or death for them and potentially the people they love. Mm -hmm. And in this adventure, they have to run the investigation, they have to figure out what they're dealing with, what's causing these problems, and prepare for the fight as well. Mm -hmm. And... In, ad in addition to that, now what would you say? What would you say were some of the big lessons that you had that you had learned from going from the Kickstarter all the all the way to release in terms of what um what you had to, what you had to learn just from just from, just by doing in the process of getting this all together? Uh, actually, the biggest thing that I learned was about uh, burnout. Uh, when you're working in any sort of artistic field, your mental state is going to have a noticeable impact on what you put out. Mm -hmm. For me, it happened more than once, probably. At least twice, one time for sure, where I was just turning this game out. I was in major burnout, working on the rules, getting the book written, making everything happen, and... In trying to do an artistic project mm -hmm. in the midst of severe burnout, I ended up making a whole bunch of mistakes that I would have to go back and correct later. Mm -hmm. Which, originally my target release for this game was the end of August. It didn't end up releasing until the end of October, early November. I've already forgotten which. <laughs> which. But uh, originally my target was end of August. And... When that came, it was like, all right, the art's not done yet. I've made all these mistakes. I'm a month behind. I got to delay the game. So I had to spend the next time not only recovering from my own burnout, but also finding the solutions for all the problems I made myself. And luckily, I found a balance in the process of how to manage my own mental health, my burnout, while also progressing the work on the book. And in doing so, I ended up coming up with brilliant ideas and changes that I needed to add into the game before it was finished, which led to the next couple months of delay. But for me, that was... There's healthy delay and unhealthy delay. You know, the first original delay was a bit of unhealthy delay of I've blown myself out uh, mentally. I did not anticipate this. I've learned from experience how to handle this, and the game has suffered as a result. And then there's the healthy delay where I'm in a role, everything's going fantastic, I'm having these brilliant ideas, I just can't release the game and put these ideas in later. They need to be in here now. Mm -hmm. But definitely the biggest thing that uh, I learned from my experience working on Warren Aether was the costs of burnout and mental health, and more than anything, how to handle it and prevent those same problems from happening. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I am going to run into less issues and ship a better quality product sooner if I just slow down and take my time instead of trying to rush it out. Yeah. Now, what with that said, what do you have? What do you have? In, what do you have in mind for down the for down the road after after the cool down from putting out this giant monstrosity of a thing by yourself. Uh, uh, oh, God. A whole combination of a whole lot, and I have no idea. On the one part, it really depends on how successful Warren Aether is initially. 
And on another part, there's all sorts of things I want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit tentative to talk about them in too much detail, because I don't want to make promises about something that I don't know when it's going to happen, let alone if it's going to happen. But for one, I know for Warren Aether specifically, there are several different expansions I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't... I don't like it when games just kind of shit out an expansion. Like, when when I do expansions, I want them to be, like, a legitimate expansion on the game. So, if it's something that I'm able to get around to doing, I want to do it up big. All sorts of dozens of new monsters, weapons, armor, new magic systems, new world to explore, new lore, all the works. You want to do an advanced but player's guide. Yeah, yeah, I want to do something that's worthy of the title of it being an expansion. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, there are also there are novels and stories I want to write. Uh, right now, I'm actually... I don't know when the first episodes will be released, but right now I'm working on a YouTube production series mm -hmm. where I want... I plan to be telling a, a, a canon story of War and Aether while also demonstrating, hey, here's the game and here's how it plays. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, there's also other tabletops. Uh, there are other tabletop systems I'm developing at the same time. Mm -hmm. They're all on or all in the early development stages. War and Aether was the one I decided to keen my focus in on and make a reality. Mm -hmm. But the overall point is that there's a whole lot I want to do, too much if I want, enough to handle years and years of content easily. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that it's all dependent on how reasonably successful am I at this, you yeah. know? War and Aether, I was lucky enough that I have my family at home supporting me, and I kind of got screwed over by a pandemic, so I was already staying home, not doing anything. I was in a position to be able to pour all of my time and effort into the book. Mm -hmm. That time's running out, and whether or not I'm going to be able to keep pushing out projects like this in the future is all dependent on how much time do I have to do it. Mm -hmm. Well... With all that, with all that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to visit the temple and once again enjoy the madness at play here. I know, always. This is always a delight to go on your show. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for more War and Aether or for one of your other projects, the door is always open. As I hey, often say around here, you made that up. offer once. I will take you up on that again. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Uh, will absolutely do. Thank you, Mildred. I really appreciate it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. Oh, and if there's one more thing I can throw in here, is that uh, if anybody listening in is interested... War and Aether, the role-playing game, is available now on DriveThroughRPG.com, and if all goes well, then it should be available as a physical paperback copy before the end of December 2021. Mm -hmm. we'll, look for we'll be looking forward to that. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>